ages. Okay, good. Uh, Why don't you try, uh, let's, let's switch who, who is high status, and I'll be high status staying here, and you enter the scene uh, in a low status mode. Not, okay. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. I've uh, been, been waiting long? Ages. Good. <laughs> All right. Then not only can we uh, manipulate our own status, it's possible to lower the status of the person you're with. All right. Let's try that. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Been waiting long? Ages. Status transactions take place all the time between all kinds of people. They're a form of interpersonal communication in which people establish their relative degrees of social status and power. They demonstrate as well as anything the social aspects of the self-concept. To manage the impression we create in others, we all engage in what's called strategic self-presentation. How we present ourselves to others so that they'll see us the way we see ourselves. Into your body and make it so grand that it would be almost total melodrama. Okay. Diana Giardella is a Boston area psychotherapist and actress who uses the tools of acting to explore the process of strategic self presentation. Okay, okay. And there you are this little. You are okay. right down there. In the following scenes, she will demonstrate how this process of self presentation works. Oh, I feel so lousy. I don't think things could get much worse. Hi. Hi. Are you going to the concert tonight? I don't know. I feel really down. I don't know. I'm in a really bummed out place. I, I don't think I can deal with it. I, I was thinking... Other people react to us according to the context our behavior has created. Then we see the way they respond to us, which confirms our original belief about the kind of person we really are. I blew it again. It's a closed circle, what researcher Mark Snyder has called behavioral confirmation. Our beliefs, our sense of self, create their own reality. That's why depressed people elicit negative reactions and tend to be treated as if, in fact, they are inadequate. While extroverts create an easygoing social climate, in which others tend to respond positively to them. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good. You going to the concert today? Yeah, I am. Looking forward to it. Great. You coming? Yeah. Oh, good. I'll see you there. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Who we are is part of a constant cycle of internal and external perceptions, beliefs, and behaviors. One of the most important factors that influence our identity is the cultural context in which we live. Cultural psychologist Hazel Marcus of Stanford University looks at the intimate connection between the self and culture. When we talk about self, we're talking about the way in which the biological being becomes a person. Becoming a person is a social endeavor. You can be a biological being all by yourself, but to become a person, to become a self, you have to engage with or take on or incorporate the cultural meanings, cultural ideas, cultural practices. You, you, you have to use those to become a person. You can't be a self by yourself. You can be a biological entity, but to be a person, to be a self, you have to do it in some set of culture-specific ways. Culture can be seen not as biologically based, but rather socially based. It is a set of behaviors and attitudes we adopt as a means of defining who we are. Lots of people tend to think of culture as something inside people, like some entity or some essence. Often people will think about the Americans have some kind of American genes or American traits or some kind of American attributes that make them American. It's absolutely not that. Culture is 
what you do. And so if you take a person and have that person connect with and, and use American ideas and American ways of doing things, that person will be an American. If you take that same person and put that person in a Japanese context, that person will become Japanese in that sense. Culture is a matter of the common ideas and the common ways of doing things. We can view culture and self as a collaboration. Culture shapes self and self perpetuates culture. This idea is known as mutual constitution and it is reflected in the artifacts, art, literature, even the media of all societies. Most of us are exposed to um, hundreds, maybe thousands of images in a given day. A lot of them you don't pay a lot of attention to, but they're out there and they shape our thinking about how to be a person, how to be a self. This is uh, Dennis Rodman. It says he's not the boy next door. That's important because none of us as Americans want to be the boy next door. This is for a cologne, a declaration of independence. What does that have to do with a clone? Who knows? But we are, after all, a culture of the individual. Ditch the Joneses. It used to be that keeping up with the Joneses is the thing to do. But now it's important not only to be up to them, be a little bit different from, from the Joneses. You will never see an ad in Japanese advertisements that says, ditch the Kiriyamas. You know, you, it just wouldn't be a sentiment that would work in, in Japan. In Japan, the goal of being a person is to be connected with others. So this is an ad that reflects that idea. The ad says, win the nearest to the pin contest. Well, clearly only one person can win the nearest to the pin contest, but they don't just show one golfer all by him or herself out on the greens, as I think an American ad might show. Instead, what they show is the whole group. They're, they're happy to be together. The way to be is to be part of it. Not, not different, not separate, not unique, but with others. More and more people these days have the opportunity, really, of being bi or tri-cultural. It's not a simple thing to do, but it'll be, it'll be the task of more and more people in the world. One of the greatest challenges to cultural identity is overcoming the threat of bigotry. The ethnic and racial prejudices of a dominant culture can eat away at the self-regard of minority people. Prejudice is a kind of psychological genocide that works across generations. It contributes to the despair, drug abuse, and violence we see in communities whose cultural identities are under siege. We see it in the high levels of depression, alcoholism, and suicide among Native Americans. And yet, even in the face of adversity, there is another side to the self that can create new realities, transforming life into art. This is what Alfred Adler called the creative self. Throughout history, men and women have put their creative imprint on anything that can be shaped, colored, or rearranged. Even in the depths of despair, prisoners of German concentration camps created art on whatever scraps of paper they could hide from their executioners to give meaning to the incomprehensible horror of their lives and deaths. Teresa Amabile of Brandeis University is a leading researcher in the psychology of creativity and the self. We did a study a few years ago looking at the effects of competition on children's creativity. Competition obviously includes elements of reward and evaluation and that competitive aspect also. We did this in the context of a party, a group sort of situation. We, had two, we ran two different parties in a community center in an apartment complex. We invited half of the girls who lived in the apartment complex to come to an art party on Saturday, and the other half we invited to come to an art party on Sunday. These were girls ages 7 through 11. The key activity both days was making a paper collage. And we told the children, you can do anything you'd like, but we want it to be a silly sort of collage. We gave them all the same kind of theme to work with. For each group, before they started their collages, I stood up at the front of the room and I said, look, I have these three neat prizes up here. And I showed them. They were, they were attractive things to 7-year-old, 11-year-old kids. In one group, the Sunday group, we said, 
we're going to award these prizes to the three best children, to the three best artworks, the children who made those, at the end of the art party. And the other group, the Saturday group, we said, we have these three prizes and we're going to raffle them off after you've made your artworks. So the prizes were there for both groups. However distracted they might have felt or excited was the same in both groups. The only difference was what those prizes meant. It was a competition or not. They all made their collages. And then later on, when we had artists look at all the collages made by the girls in both groups and rate them on creativity, we found that those made by the girls in the competition group were significantly less creative. The competition group children tended to make very ordinary kinds of symbols, whereas the children in the non-competition group, some of them used just a few pieces in their collage. Some of them used almost all of the pieces that they had. They really did a lot of non-representational things in the non-competition group. We have found, as a, a grand principle in all of our research, that people will be most creative when they feel motivated primarily by the interest and enjoyment, the satisfaction, the challenge of the work itself, and not by external pressures. So now you know some of the ways in which psychologists try to follow the Delphic Oracle's exhortation to know thyself. We've explored a number of aspects of the self which each of us knows intimately, but which psychologists must try to understand objectively and scientifically. And we've also seen how we differ in our self-concepts and how our behavior differs as a result. In our next program, we're going to pursue this subject of individual differences a bit further, only this time from the perspective of psychologists whose job it is to measure these differences among us in creativity, intelligence, and personality. We'll find out how they do it and how well. Next time, I'm Philip Zimbardo. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org. To learn more about the Annenberg CPB channel series and workshops for teachers, how to take them for credit, how to buy them on video cassette, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org/channel. The Annenberg CPB channel.